Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar here today. My name is Eugene Lee. I'll be your host for today. Uh, today's webinar, uh, Assistive Living, uh, Assistive Gadgets for Living Well with Parkinson's, has been brought to you by iElder.Asia uh, in collaboration with the uh, Malaysian Association for Parkinson's Disease. Um, so today we'll be talking a little bit more about what kinds of gadgets that you can use um, for to improve the quality of life for your loved ones or for your patients that you're taking care of uh, with Parkinson's. Uh, but before we begin today's webinar, I'd like to invite our founder, uh, Dr. Kong Wai Hong, to say a few words. Dr. Kong. Okay. Mm, thank you, uh, Eugene. A uh, very good morning, uh, Ms. Sarah, President of Malaysian Parkinson's Disease Association and esteemed members of Malaysian Parkinson's Disease Association, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen. So Parkinson's disease is a brain disorder that leads to shaking, stiffness and difficulty with walking, balance and coordination. Parkinson's symptoms usually begin gradually and get worse over time. So as the disease progresses, people may have difficulty walking and talking. So they may also have mental and behavioral changes, sleep problems, depression, memory difficulties, and fatigue. So both men and women can have Parkinson's disease. However, the disease affects about 50% more men than women. So one clear risk factor for Parkinson is age. So although most, most people with Parkinson first develop the disease is about age 60. About five to 10% of people with Parkinson have early onset disease, which begin before the age of 50. Early onset form of Parkinson are often, but not always inherited and some form has been linked to the specific gene mutations. So although there is no cure for Parkinson's disease, so medicines, surgical treatment, and other therapies can offer relieve some symptoms. They include physical, occupational therapy, and speech therapies, which help with the gait and voice disorder, tremors and rigidity, and decline in mental functions. Other supportive therapies include the health diet and exercise to strengthen muscles and improve balance. So iElders.Asia have been providing cost-effective products to meet a family's need by assisting them to make an informed decision about senior care products. So our focus is on aged care, medical technology, medtech, and healthcare products and services that offer comfort, safety, security, including aid for daily living. So our business ethos, which is embedded in whatever we do, is to create a better life for the elderly with the assurance that our entire value chains of products and service reliability, the delivery and the user friendly design is of the highest quality. In conjunction with the April being the Parkinson's Barrest Month, so Malaysian Parkinson Disease Association with iElders.Asia, a subsidiary of AIM, to have a sharing session on assisted gadgets for living well with Parkinson. So provide inclusive aging solution. So we are in the journey together as aging is a normal, uh, is a natural phenomenon. So through this sharing session, we will see further exploration of aging solutions and develop a, of tools that will enable us to age well progressively within a well-supported ecosystem propagated with a quality of life as envisioned. So thank you for spending your valuable time to attend our IELTS Zoom webinar on today. Eugene, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kong. Uh, as Dr. Kong mentioned, he, us here at IELTS Asia, we work together um, to provide solutions to all manner of elderly people and those who are in need of uh, living aids, especially for those who are, have disabilities. Yeah? So um, 
we deal with a lot of patients uh, that have uh, motor neuron, Parkinson's, and all those uh, uh, patients that are in need of, of something to assist them when it comes to the lack of motor skills here as well. We also work together with a variety of partners, uh, physiotherapists, occupational therapists. And here today for our webinar, we have invited one of our partners from Global Home Health, Mr. Benjamin Knowles Bashan, uh, to join us here today to speak on the topic of assistive gadgets. Ah, but before we uh, welcome Mr. Benjamin, uh, I'd like to invite Ms. Sarah, the Chairman or President of uh, Malaysia's uh, Association of Parkinson's Disease, to say a few words. Ms. Sarah? Uh, thank you, Eugene, for the introduction. And thank you, uh, Dr. Kong, for giving a brief outline about what Parkinson's is. And uh, on behalf of our association, I would like to thank you for the collaboration. Um, this as Dr. Kong said just now, um, this webinar is held in conjunction with April being the Parkinson's Awareness Month. And for the information of many, um, World Parkinson's Day falls on April 11 this year. And also the red tulip is the symbol for Parkinson's. It's like pink ribbon for, you know, for cancer. Um, Oftentimes, uh, as the president of the association, I have been asked by a lot of members, what are the best assistive uh, equipment or gadget for, you know, to use? Because Parkinson's, um, they, through, throughout the journey, they go through different severity. We thought that the, the gadget that we have is the best for us and also the best cost for us. But I am just like many of them, and I was actually because my late father had Parkinson's. We thought that uh, that was the best, but I couldn't afford that professional advice. So recently, when I met Olivia Pua, and she so graciously came to our center, so we discussed about this, and then we came up with the idea that why don't we have a web data and let the professionals come talk to us. So hence the collaboration today. So thank you very much. We are very thankful that we have you to come and share with us your expertise and the items that you could to help people with Parkinson's to improve the quality of life. Thank you so much. Over to you, Eugene. Thank you very much, Ms. Sarah. And thank you, uh, the Association of Parkinson's Disease of Malaysia for uh, collaborating with us to make today's sharing session uh, possible. Now, without further ado, uh, thank you everyone for your patience. Uh, now we'd like to invite our guest speaker for today, Mr. Benjamin Knowles Vashen from Global Home Health. Mr. Benjamin. I can continue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, thanks for coming here, uh, Benjamin, uh, taking your much. time off on this Saturday to come and speak to us and share a little bit about uh, assistive gadgets for Parkinson's. I believe today we have over, I think, 30 or 40 signups. Wow. So, yeah, we have a lot of people who are very eager to learn about how they can improve the quality of life for the loved ones or how they can take better care mm -hmm. on what kinds of gadgets they can, can sort of like use to take good care of uh, the, uh, their loved ones and their patients. So uh, before we delve into it, uh, would you like to tell our audience a little bit about your experiences in global home health and what is it that you, you exactly do and your experience with Parkinson's patients? Sure. So um, a physiotherapist by profession, I am the rehab manager for a company, as you mentioned, Global Home Health. We are based in Moncara and we do two main types of services. We have home nursing and home physiotherapy. What we do is we work with patients upon discharge from hospitals back to the comfort of their homes. Now, working with multiple types of patients with multiple types of conditions, Parkinson's disease diagnosed patients be one of them. Now, as Dr. Kong mentioned, um, there are a couple of key main symptoms that Parkinson's diagnosed patients tend to exhibit. And there are also a few other symptoms that follow later on. So the main ones being 
the tremors in the hands and the legs often on one side, but it can affect other parts as well. You also see the rigidity, which can cause an increased tone in muscle. This can often be very uncomfortable for some patients. You also see some slowness in movement or bradykinesia, as we should call it. Okay. Now, this can affect multiple types of movements for each patient. It could be walking, taking steps, could even be time taken to feed themselves. All these things might be very fast for someone like you and I, but when we talk about someone diagnosed with Parkinson's, especially as the disease unfortunately progresses, we tend to see them taking a lot longer to perform even the simplest of activities. In addition to that, you also see difficulties with balancing and coordination. Now, when combined together, these symptoms together tend to make it very difficult for certain patients with Parkinson's to move about. So how we try our best to overcome these difficulties, we as physiotherapists, we tend to assess each patient individually because we have to take into account that no two patients, although diagnosed with Parkinson's, is ever the same. Taking into account their age, the amount of symptoms they have, their severity, we assess, we identify, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. And based on that, as a physiotherapist myself, I try to correct, to improve, to strengthen. And in addition to using some certain exercises, some correction, we also use certain aids. These aids are designed in addition to the exercise that we provide to try to make life a little bit more easier for patients diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your insight on that. Uh, and speaking of uh, living aids, we'll be delving quite deep into a variety of living aids here today. Uh, IL.Asia, we do provide uh, some medical equipment. Um, we are actually a medical equipment supplying company. So a lot of uh, customers that come to us, they are usually tell us a little bit about what they're going through. And hopefully here today, together with uh, Benjamin, we'll be able to sort of give you some tips and tricks here today, especially uh, and also what kinds of gadgets to look out for if you are looking to overcome a certain symptom. Okay, you mentioned earlier that some of the uh, challenges that these Parkinson's patients might go through would be in terms of mobility, correct? Yes. So like, let's say if, um, I know that uh, you mentioned also that different Parkinson's, you know, the symptoms they exhibit are different. So what kinds of Parkinson's patients would probably, uh, you know, what kinds of challenges would they encounter in regards to mobility. So the simplest one would be difficulty in moving about or even walking okay. freely because they have, as I mentioned earlier, uh, difficulties with coordination and balancing. These make them prone for falls. Mm -hmm. Now you tend to hear a lot of stories. We've had a lot of cases whereby family members who engage us explain how this person has been diagnosed with either Parkinson's or Parkinson's plus and they started noticing at first a lot of history of falls and they come to us and ask what we can do. So to reduce that, once we have assessed and all that, we try to advise them or rather encourage them to get certain walking needs. The easiest being um, a walking stick. Okay. okay. Now there are a few types of walking sticks. You have the single leg cane. You also have one with three legs, we call a tripod. You have one with four legs, we call a quadripod. Now in the case of patients diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, we usually recommend the single leg cane because it's one leg, easier, lighter to move about, and it doesn't increase the risk of a patient tripping over as opposed to using one with three legs or four legs. Again, single leg always better in cases of patients with Parkinson's disease because it reduces the risk of them kicking or tripping against one of those legs and unfortunately falling over. Okay. All right. Now, um, now that we've spoken about uh, walking cane, the single leg walking cane. Now you can get it with eye elder or any other pharmacy. However, I have one here today. Now, just to show. Now, how do we use this? Especially for a patient who has been diagnosed with Parkinson's, right? Mm -hmm. Now, first and foremost, once you've bought it, you will notice they have all these holes up here to identify the proper height. So what is the proper height? You need to understand in order to understand or rather to determine the proper right height for a particular patient, you want to make sure first and foremost, the patient, if I can show it here, is standing upright first, wearing proper footwear, standing upright 
if the patient has a curved posture around that back, we want to try to make sure they are upright as much as they can, hands on either side, and then you take the walking cane and you put it on the patient's most dominant side. Now, which one is the dominant side is very subjective from one patient to another. Mm -hmm. So I'm using myself as a model today. I, having assessed myself, I have noticed that I am more dominant on my right side. So I want to place the walking cane on my right before I hold it. So somebody, let's assume, is holding it for me. Hands by the side. You want to make sure the crease of the wrist. So what the crease is, is if you can look at your own wrist, you notice some lines at the edge just before your, where your palm starts. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure the top of your cane is in line with the crease of your wrist. And that is the height you want. You never do it with your elbows bent. We always start off with our elbows and hands straight down, mm -hmm. in line with the handle, and then we adjust the height accordingly. Is there a particular reason for why it must be a crease? Yes. We use the crease as a guide because when we end up holding it, there is a slight bend. So ah. even though there is a slight bend, you notice my body is not curved too far forward. If my body is already too curved forward, too far forward, even with the use of the walking frame, then I haven't measured it properly, which means even if I use it, if I were to trip, there is a very high risk, I might fall head first and injure myself. I see. So the rule of thumb is whether you're using a single leg cane or you are using, for example, a walking frame, for example, which we'll go into later, the method of measurement is always the same. Patient stands straight up, feet apart, never close together, Head looking forward, posture upright, never curved, elbow straight down, and then we use the top of the cane or the frame in line with the crease of the wrist or this prominent bone at the end of your little finger here, mm -hmm. and then we adjust the height accordingly. We want to make sure the cane is always on the dominant side. Now, for those viewing who are not familiar with what a dominant side is, we can always get in touch with us later and we can try our best to help and assist. Sure. Right. So dominant side, to my understanding, is basically uh, which hand you might write with. Is that like in which, some cases, which yes. hand feels like there's more control? Yes. Right? So we usually assess both hands. Mm -hmm. We try to get them to do some exercises, and then we identify, and then we say, okay, look, this is your more dominant side. We have noticed. We also notice that to talk about dominant side, it's not just writing. We also look at where a patient tends to favor their legs. So sometimes if you look at people standing, right, they tend to lean towards one side because they're more comfortable, they feel more stable. We also use that as a guide, as a compass as well, taking into account, of course, the hand strength and all that. Nice. And then we determine from that. We have one more walking cane, I think. Yes. Over there. So uh, I'm not sure if your audience, can your audience see? Perfect, yeah. So uh, I'm going to take this and I'm trying, going to try to measure it according to the tips that you give me and you can tell me whether I'm doing it right or not. Yes. So the audience can also like, you know, they can do it at home. So if I stand straight, then I'm supposed to measure it according to my crease. Does it have to be below the crease or directly right on, the, on crease? the crease? Now, sometimes there might be a little bit of extra, but the rule of thumb is you try to get the tip as close to your crest of the wrist as close as possible. Okay, so this one would probably be a little low. It's for lower for you. You have to go a little higher then. Okay. What, what if, you know, I go to the maximum height and you kind of go any higher? Then you need another cane. <laughs> Um, do they typically come in different sizes, walking cane? So the cane comes usually one fit for all, but the height is the one that's uh, variable. So regardless of the brand of cane that you get, usually mm -hmm. they all fit everybody. The only thing that needs to be adjusted, as I said, is the height. I see. Yes. What about the grip? Like, Is there a proper way to grip the, the cane? You want a firm grip usually. Now, again, there are some patients who have difficulty gripping. So in those instances, we want to start off first and foremost with some exercises to help strengthen the grip first so that they can hold better. I see. So if they cannot hold, we usually don't recommend a single leg cane at all. Does, does this part actually go in between the fingers? Um, it goes like so, yes. Ah, okay. So one, one finger under, thumb above, and then you grip it tight. You never use a soft grip. You want to make sure you've got a firm grip because mm -hmm. this thing is helping you stabilize yourself. It's adding extra support. I see, I see. So I'm, if I walk, then I... Oh yeah, it, it does feel better when it's only like slightly like Yeah. It feels a lot more stable here. What, um, what about the walker though? Like, could you maybe demonstrate for us uh, how to like, do a proper grip and how the proper adjustment method for a walker? Sure, let's yeah. go yeah. to the other sure. side. No problem. Okay, I can sort of see you there. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's better if I turn side so you can actually see. Sure, no problem. Um, 
I'm not sure if the audience can hear you while you're all the way over there. Audience, can, can you guys hear him? Can you guys hear well, him? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's say a patient doesn't feel too comfortable using the single leg weight. Mm -hmm. In those instances, we do a little bit of exercise to strengthen the lower limbs, and then we recommend that boy offer something that we call a walking frame. Now, there are a couple of types. So, we have a regular walking frame, a walking frame here with four firm legs. We also have one that we call a wafer frame that has two wheels in front. We also have a frame that has four wheels. So, depending on which, after assessment, we recommend usually we start off with the general walking frame here, which I have. So, again, the method of measurement is the same. I stand upright, head straight, shoulders in line, never curved, never rounded, hands by the side, the top of the handles. Okay, I want to make sure again my wrist is in line with it, with my elbow straight. Okay, that way when I hold it, when I take it, there is a slight bend. So if you want, there is a bend, just not enough to push it forward. So if you see patients, who are holding a water frame, but they are walking like this, then the measurement of the frame in itself is wrong. Okay, we always want to make sure that when we measure, the patient is standing as close to upright as possible. Sometimes for some patients in uh, Parkinson's disease, they might have a little bit of problem pushing themselves up and holding. So we try our best to measure and we do it for them instead. And then we try to walk that way and we do hold it, even though difficult to hold upright. Just from holding at the proper measure height, they'll be able to prop themselves up as well. From there, if they can lift, if they've got good upper limb strength, they lift a little bit. They move with the weaker leg first, stronger leg stays in the back, and only then does the stronger leg follow forward. So in my case, as we discussed with the single leg came earlier, I was more dominant on the right side. So likewise, when I'm using the walker frame, I lift the frame slightly forward, never too far forward, because that thing works. The moment I lift my body goes into a bend, we never want this. Just slightly forward. Left leg, which is my weaker leg, goes half a foot forward. My right leg stabilizes me as my left leg moves forward, and my right leg follows suit, and then I'm leaving. We always try our best to encourage the patients, especially Parkinson's diagnosis patients, to open their feet a little bit. Because what we notice is the most sharper gait when the steps are very small. When the steps are very small, if at all the patient doesn't effectively relate their foot properly, they might trip. Again, when you're using a walking frame or even a walking stick or any assistive device, the moment you trip, because you have problems in coordinating and balancing yourself, most of the time they tend to fall forwards. Very seldom do they fall backwards or sideways. So we always try the moment we advise them to use an assistive device, we start correcting it first and foremost. So they work, the exercise and the correction will work hand in hand. A little bit of exercise, so we open the feet. These have to be done repeatedly, religiously, and together with that, they finish off by getting their foot more. So uh, if I can just ask a question here, uh, when does, uh, when, when do I get a walking cane and when do I get a walker? Like what's the defining difference, most defining difference? Okay. How do I know which one is most suitable for me? Will depend on how advanced I am in my disease progression. Now, bear in mind, Parkinson's is a progressive one, unfortunately, which means over a period of time, the symptoms will gradually progress and unfortunately worsen. So, let's say walking stick. If I'm the type of patient, upon being assessed, I have a little bit of balance issue, but with minimal assistance, I am able to move around freely. In those instances, we recommend starting off with just the cane first. We see how well they can move. Again, with the advice, with the assessment from the ESO, then we inform the family members as well. Look, this is good. We continue with this first and foremost. But again, must be supervised. We already know people who are diagnosed with Parkinson's tend to have a very high risk of falling and tripping because of balancing issues. We want to make sure they are always observed and supervised. That's for the cane. Now, the walker. If the patient feels, even with the cane, they still feel a little bit shaky. The words they use are not stable, especially if they say they don't feel confident. You will know they're not confident the moment they try to walk, they have difficulty in lifting. Or you might see them shifting too much to one side. You never want to see people shifting too much to one side of the cane. That is your indication as a therapist, as a medical service provider, to say, look, 
I don't think this is suitable for you. You have to go and do something that's a lot safer. In this case, the water frame. As I said, you can choose between the water frame or one of the wheels, the waiter, depending on how well the patient's coordination is. If the patient has a certain amount of upper body strength, just worrying about the legs being a little weaker, then you use the fixed walking to the rigid one. If they have a little bit more fine motor control, they're able to understand certain instructions and all that, then you can change this from the fixed one to the one with the two wheels that has the brakes there. So the patient is able to walk a certain distance. When tired, or if they're doing fatigue, which is something you do see in these patients, they have a brake to control. They stop themselves, catch their breath before they continue. What we don't want to see though, whether they're using a fixed frame or the one with the wheels, is this. <coughs> yeah, you never want this. Uh -huh. You also see this in patients who use the single leg cane. They tend to, instead of putting the cane and walking and putting, they lift the cane like a handbag and then they just continue to walk. You know, you never want that. Never see. Especially, and I keep stressing this, especially in patients diagnosed with Parkinson's because they are at very high risk of falling. Now, with their small shuttle gait, especially, if you see this movement at all, one trip uh, falls with and they will fall forward, and the next thing you are thinking about, having to worry about rather, is uh, a fracture or a break or a traumatic brain injury, something like that. So, to avoid all these things, we always have the physio assess the individual patient. We understand where their strength and weakness levels are at first. We see how dependent, independent they are. And from there, we advise. Once we have advice, we start off with small steps first before we progress to bigger movements with the aid of the, either the cane or the brain. I see, I see. Yes. Thank you very much for your input, uh, Benjamin. Yeah. So, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, we've talked about now the, the cane and the, the walker. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you very much, Benjamin, for, for, your, for your insight on the, the cane and the walker. So um, in the same category, right, when it comes to mobility, um, what about patients that are a little bit more, you know, advanced in terms of the Parkinson's disease when they already lose the ability to walk on their own? Uh, over here, typically, we, we have a wide, very, very wide variety of wheelchairs, right? So most of the, the patients, when they come, when they lose, start to lose functions in their ability to walk, ability to take care of themselves, um, what type of wheelchair would you think uh, or would you suggest is uh, proper for a Parkinson's patient? Okay. So we have here two types of wheelchairs. I either has an array of them. I asked for two types just to explain the difference. Now, in patients who have Parkinson's that has unfortunately progressed to such a level where mobility of their own with the wheelchair, I use the walker frame or the walking cane is difficult. We try to advise using the wheelchair. Now, which wheelchair is most convenient, most suitable for me, will depend on how strong their leg strength is. So let's say a uh, uh, Parkinson's patient who has progressed in uh, a similar profession. Most of the time they have uh, either caregivers or family members assisting them to do a lot of things. So if the patient requires minimal assistance to transport, meaning for example, if I were to transfer the patient, for example, from a bed to the wheelchair, if the patient, once I assist, is able to at least stand up, listen to my instruction when I say, Okay, look, you're going to turn a little bit and subsequently sit down. Then, this is the type of wheelchair I have mentioned because the armrests are fixed. The patient is able to listen to my instruction with minimal assistance. I'm able to help transfer the patient. This is the wheelchair I go to. Now, this is one model. There are plenty of types of wheelchairs that have fixed armrests that cannot be removed. That's one example. If, for example, in another occasion, I have another patient extremely dependent on the caregiver to do every movement, especially when it comes to transferring and all that. The patient is able to at least sit and get a bit, but it's not strong enough to prop themselves up to transfer. In that occasion, I would recommend this wheelchair. This wheelchair because the armrests are easily movable. What happens is when you have a movable armrest here, right? The distance required to transfer the patient from the bed 
to the video chat and video chat back to the page is a lot lesser. And in doing so, it reduces risk and it is also safer, not just for the patient, but also for the caregiver helping that patient. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Benjamin, I have another question. Yes. Um, over here, we typically have uh, more like wheelchairs that typically we, we are sought by yes. patients with a uh, more, what do you call that? Like uh, their, their needs are more specific, right? For example, the reclining wheelchair, the tilt in place wheelchair. Yes. So uh, when it comes to these kinds of wheelchairs for Parkinson's patients, um, what is your take on, on these like do Parkinson's patients like generally need these sorts of wheelchairs does it provide any extra comfort you mentioned that Parkinson's patients uh, maybe have a little bit of a loss of balance lots of motor skills so would having a high back uh, type of wheelchair a high type of wheelchair assist them at all improve their quality of life all these hubs when they better support the back for these types of patients you know one that is slouching too much Slouching too much for usually the back pain in the lower, the lower back region, and we never really want that to happen in these types of patients. So the back the support the back always better. Now we have right now multiple models of wheelchairs, and wheelchairs currently come with ergonomic functions, meaning they are designed in such a way to protect your lower back. They are cushioned in such a way that they follow the contours of your back to help minimize or rather reduce the risk of back ache and pain, especially for patients who are extremely poor in mobility with the later stages of the disease. You tend to see them most of the time choosing to be regular. Or you might hear family members, caregivers say, patient don't want to move. Patient prefer to lie in bed. While they might prefer to lie in bed, the problem with prolonged lying in bed is the risk of developing bed sore. Now, the longer they lie flat in a fixed position for a longer period of time, the higher the chance of the bed sore occurring, and the longer left, the bigger, deeper it will get, and that will lead to infection, sepsis, so on and so forth. To minimize that risk, or to avoid that from happening, if you have a reclining chair that you have, that's probably designed for the contours of the back, as I said, the caregiver can then help transfer the patient at least from the bed to the wheelchair for a couple of hours before transferring subsequently the patient back to the bed. We don't want patients to lie in bed too long. Regardless of what condition they might be in terms of symptom progression and whatnot, you always want to try to encourage movement as best you can. Whether the patient is able to move with assistance or whether the patient requires the caregiver's assistance to fully move about, you always want to try to encourage that little bit of movement. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Benjamin, I see over there you have a, a different type of wheelchair. Are these ones the electric, the power type of wheelchairs? Yes. Would you recommend this one for Parkinson's patients? So, the, when it comes to the electric wheelchair, usually in the later stages of Parkinson's disease, only then do we advise and recommend these patients to start using. So, um, family members might say we want to take our parents out of Parkinson's type of patient out and on, but it's difficult for them to move, but they still want to go. In occasions like those, in instances like those, then we recommend using the electric wheelchair or a motorized scooter. Now, before you decide if you want to get it for a particular patient, you want to check whether the patient has proper orientation, number one. Whether the patient has severe tremors or mild tremors that are able to control the medication. If they fit this kind of criteria, then definitely a motorized wheelchair or a scooter is the go-to. If the patient has severe tremors, unable to control, now bear in mind, it's remote, they move forward, they move backwards, but the speed is more or less less. Now, if your hand is shaking, the wheelchair is not going to just go forward. Depending on how bad your travels are, they might keep going backward forward, which unfortunately that makes the purpose of the chair null and void. Okay, so always check with the patient. Again, get them assessed, identify how severe or not so severe the symptoms are, whether they are able to follow simple instruction, whether they have proper hand strength. Because you need strength to be able to move. The grip strength has to be a certain amount of strong. You have different types of grip for different types of treatments and all that. For that, you want to make sure they are able to properly follow instructions before putting them here to train them. Now again, it's not just putting them on and having them just move about with the motorized wheelchair. 
what makes sure the environment in which you're going to put this patient at the school that it is conducive for its use. You want to make sure there's a big area for them to walk about. You want to make sure there are no obstacles because bear in mind, these aren't really terrain friendly or land friendly or half friendly. So if you have an obstacle in front and the speed is fixed and the patient is just going to go across, most of the time, our patients tend not to look down. They are able to look straight, they have to look left, right, maybe even back, but again, because they're sitting down, their periphery is always spread forward. So when we advise them to use these wheelchairs and all that, we want, we want to inform the family members first and foremost, always supervise, number one, make sure the seat belts are fastened. We want to make sure that it's ample space, ample room around whatever the area might be, so that the patient can move it easily. And we want to make sure there are no obstacles around. So if you're, for example, taking a patient to a park, you want to make sure the patient is taken to a park that's friendly for wheelchairs to move about. Because certain wheels work better on certain terrains, while others don't work as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh what about any uh, are the other attributes of a wheelchair? Are there any other attributes of a wheelchair that um, caretakers need to be aware of or need to look out for when it comes to choosing the wheelchair for their Parkinson's patient? Uh, does it have to be lightweight? Does the seat width matter? Okay, now there are a few things. You want to make sure, first and foremost, as I said earlier, understand where your patient's levels are. So if you're a caregiver, this is for your mother, your father, uh, your spouse. You want to understand how strong they are, how coordinated they are, that's number one. Number two, you want to take into account their body size. If they are like me, more or less skinny, a little bit of tummy, then you want a smaller size wheelchair. So that when I sit the patient on the wheelchair, they are comfortable enough with just enough room to move from side to side. But not wide enough that once I put them on, after a period of time, they start slouching and slumping forward. Mm -hmm. Even with the seat belt. Then I unfortunately got the wrong size to the chair. In addition to that, if the patient comes, or uh, a caregiver comes first to the patient, says he likes being on the wheelchair for longer periods than he likes being on, for example, the bed, he wants to be on the wheelchair more, then you want to get a wheelchair, a motorized one, with proper cushion, with proper back support. The longer this space is down, we call it a sedentary lifestyle, which leads to a number of problems, especially in the spine and the back. Likewise, applies for a Parkinson's diagnosis patient. And if they don't spend plenty of time on the wheelchair, you want something that's comfortable, you want something that's smooth, you want something that follows the back of the spine, that aligns with your spine to provide better support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much on that thorough explanation. I definitely learned a lot today. Um, there is, while we're on the subject of mobility, right, uh, one of the biggest enemies or obstacles, right, that a uh, wheelchair users face, not just one with Parkinson, uh, is stairs, right? Because over here in Malaysia, not just the apartments, like even sometimes a uh, landed property, before you head into it, you always have these like one, two, three steps, right? So uh, in, your, in your field of work, have you ever seen or can you recommend any solutions when it comes to tackling um, stairs or, or flights of stairs? I, I know that um, certain businesses use ramps, yeah. but what in the case where uh, you can't install a ramp? Because... Okay. If a patient lives in a home with a couple of decks of stairs, patient lives upstairs, there's no room for the patient to be based downstairs, but the patient still wants to be in a position to move up and down freely. In those instances, what we recommend is a stand lift. Now, a stand lift is easily installed. Imagine a small seat connected to a small metal bar that's electronic. A patient is put on it, fastened into a seat belt, and then the caregiver, family member, whoever that might be, presses a button, and the patient is gently carried up. Similar to a lift, the only difference being there is no work on the patient's part. The only thing the patient needs to do is sit down comfortably, take a few deep breaths, and um, I'm being told, I, I do believe we do have a video of a stair lift, so I think I'm going to play, we're going to play that video for our audience here, uh, we can take a look at it and then you can give maybe your two cents on the stair lift video to see if there's any, anything that uh, we want to look out for when it comes to stair lift safety, okay, uh, so please enjoy the video.
Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, what do you think of the video like this, the static video, right? If this chair was able to shift to one side. Um, when it comes to Parkinson's patients, is there any safety risk when it comes to, you know, putting the patient onto the seat itself? Not really, as long as the patient is able to understand what you're trying to do. Now, very important, whether it's a Parkinson's diagnosed patient or any geriatric patient for that matter, your instruction as the caregiver very important. So now again, if you imagine sitting on the lift and like trying to tell that to a patient, look, you're going to sit on the lift and it's just going to go up. Your first instinct is scared. <laughs> yeah. Right? When a patient feels scared, if a patient is going to feel scared, especially when they're initially going to try it for the first few times, right? It's up to the caregiver, the individual caregiver, whoever that might be, to first and foremost reassure the patient. So for example, look, we're going to put you on it. There's going to be a seatbelt. It's going to move. You might feel a little bit shaky because it's moving against gravity, right? To go up and down. But whatever happens, I'm going to be walking with you. Okay? Because whatever happens, you have to understand the stair lift is by the stairs itself. So as the patient is going up, so is the caregiver following as well. So for reassuring purposes, to make the patient feel a little bit more at ease as the patient is being transferred up and down, you can always say, look, if you want, I can hold your hand. If you want, take a few deep breaths. Studies have shown deep breathing in through your nose, exhaling out through your mouth gently has shown that it is a very good way for relaxing yourself, for calming yourself. So these simple things definitely can help the patient. Whether the seat is movable and all that, some patients prefer coming up vertically. We've also worked with some patients who prefer the chair rotated a little bit more horizontal to the stairs instead. That one is solely individual preference. It depends again on the height of the stairs, how inclined they are or not inclined and what the patient wants. If the patient is okay to go up vertically, so be it. If they prefer going horizontally, again, no problem. Because whatever happens, they are fastened to a seatbelt. The seatbelt is very, very tight. You can add an extra Velcro if you want. Velcro straps are very cheap to get now. Mm -hmm. To add as an extra protective barrier, and then you just assist the patient up. The speed at which the patient moves up the lift is usually very, very fixed. It's never fast. It's always very slow. So you can take up to a minute, a minute and a half, depending on how many flights of stairs the patient is traveling yeah. to go from top to bottom and vice versa. Yeah, in the earlier video, we actually saw that the, the chair itself was traveling really slowly. It seemed pretty comfortable. Uh, but then it could be, again, like you mentioned, varies from patient to patient. It's individual, very subjective, I would say. I see, I see. Okay, just to recap what we have so far, we talked about mobility. We talked about different kinds of canes uh, and the difference between canes and walkers, when you should get a cane, when you should get a walker, how to properly adjust the height of the cane and the walker. We also talked about wheelchairs and uh, different types of wheelchairs, which one you should get and what to look out for. If you're looking out for someone who, who is uh, wheelchair bound or, or rather that needs to use, use the wheelchair for a long time, uh, a back, uh, higher back support might be able to help. If the patient needs to be transferred quite often, then of course, look out for the smaller wheels and the adjustable hand rest. Okay, so we've covered mobility, right? Yes. So now let's talk about some of the challenges that Parkinson's patients face when it comes to day-to-day -day activities. You mentioned before that tasks that might seem simple to any of us might take them longer, might be more difficult for them. So what are some of the, you know, just for an example, day-to-day -day challenges that a Parkinson patient might have trouble with? Um, they are not one, but quite a few. Um, if you talk about something that is done in the dining area, then let's talk eating. Mm -hmm. So what you might notice in certain Parkinson's patients, especially in the later stages, and we're talking a lot about patients in the later stages, slowness in movement, as I mentioned earlier, bradykinesia will make it very difficult for them to perform even the process of, example, holding a spoon, scooping a little bit of food, whether it's rice or noodles or something along those lines, and then subsequently bringing it closer to their mouth, trying to rotate that spoon into the mouth so that the food goes in, and finally chewing. Everything that I just mentioned, as the disease unfortunately progresses, takes a lot longer. You might notice initially in the initial stages, easy to scoop, easy to lift, easy to put into the mouth. But as it progresses, a lot longer. So one mouth or one spoonful might take a minute, a minute and a half, sometimes even longer if you take time to time it, right? So in those instances, over an extended period of time, we tend to notice a lot of patients just choose not to do it at all. 
Yeah. When you ask why, if they're able to explain from experience, they say because, like I said, if one spoon takes so long and you're never just having one spoon of rice. Does it, as it gets worse to Parkinson's patients, eventually just move to a liquid diet? Yes. It's if they have, if and when they have problems with swallowing, chewing, mm -hmm. then usually the doctor prescribes or recommends going on to a full liquid diet, a semi-soft to a liquid diet, depending on how well or how not well they're able to chew and swallow. Again, that is also based off the recommendation assessment of a speech therapist. Okay. Yes. So uh, let's talk more in the realm of visual, right? Yes. So for Parkinson's patients that are starting to experience tremors in their hands, start to lose control of their motor skills. Um, what is the biggest factor when it comes to enabling them to, to sort of like continue to live independently without the, the aid of a, a caretaker feeding them? Now, if you're going to talk about not having the help of a caretaker to help to aid, then you want to make sure the patient first and foremost has a certain amount of strength. Strength. Yeah. So we have multiple types of strength, everybody, regardless of what condition you might be, whether you're healthy or not healthy, you need strength to perform daily activities. So eating no different. So we have different types of grips in our hand. We have um, power grip, which is responsible for certain types of movements. We have precision grip, something that's more uh, specialized in terms of movement. So for example, if I am going to hold a spoon to scoop, a knife, a pen, these are examples of where precision grips are quiet. So, so the more delicate, the yeah. dexterous type. Yes, because you need to hold a little bit more uh, finely. And usually these things that you need to do when it comes to eating and all that, the utensils provided, whether it's a fork, a spoon, a knife, mm -hmm. a teaspoon, a tablespoon, whatever it might be, usually they are thinner. And in patients who are struggling with Parkinson's disease, you tend to notice their ability to grip gradually reduce over time because of the increase in muscle tone rigidity we call it so when we want to try to see if they can be a little bit more closer to independent as possible we want to first and foremost train these muscles first try to loosen them up reduce that stiffness so how do you loosen the muscles so we do simple stretches but these stretches have to be frequent they have to be repetitive now when we try to ask the patient to do it on their own as a home exercise program Often they're not, they will try to do. But again, when I say these have to be repeated, I mean anytime you are awake, you are aware, you're free, you should do as best you can. Again, often easier said than done, I understand. Yep. Especially when we're talking about these types of patients who are undergoing a progressive disease. But we always say the faster you try, the higher the chance of delaying this onset from happening. It is going to happen. I'm not saying it won't happen. That will be inaccurate. But we're trying to delay as best we can. And in addition with the stretches, with the exercises, we also try to work with the OT to come up with certain equipments to help make their lives a little easier. Speaking of OT, since uh, today's webinar, we're talking about assistive gadgets, right? We do have something here that uh, we have uh, some of our partners from, from OT and uh, cerebral palsy, associated with cerebral palsy, we've introduced this to them recently. It's just called an easy hold. And what these are, these are silicone uh, food grade safe uh, cuffs, right? And I'm just gonna show you how they typically use it. And you can tell me whether this or not would be handy for say Parkinson's patient, yeah. So what we do is uh, we take any utensil that they're gonna be using, these come in different sizes, and you just thread them through this hole. Now, this is typically done by a caretaker, you know, you would assume because sure. <laughs> if you are having with um, motor skills like that, this I, I would presume is precision grip. Yes. Yeah? So this precision grip. Okay. And what we do for the CP patients and uh, the elderly is that we just put it through their hands to provide them with a more, uh, you know, uh, this solves, I think, mostly the grip issue. Yes. Right? For those occupation therapists or those disabled, they don't really have uh, use of their arms and their hands anymore. We sort of recommend this. I'm going to pass this to you and uh, see if you have any comments on, on this and whether or not you'll be able to help Parkinson's. So as you said, uh, they have problems with grip and all that. It definitely helps solve. But again, I must point out when choosing or deciding if your patient is able to use something like this, you must identify the degree or severity of the tremors experienced by said patients. 
Now, bear in mind, these tremors can start off very, very mild, barely noticeable. It could come to a stage where it's extremely violent, extremely uncontrolled, even with the help of medication and aids. So, again, if the tremors are easily controlled, they have some amount of motor movement, meaning they're able to at least bend, they are able to rotate to scoop. Because if you can imagine scooping rice, it's a rotation movement before you bring it closer to your mouth. If they're able to perform, then we recommend this no problem. Can definitely be used. Although it doesn't help them grip better, it solves the issue of them not being able to grip something this small using precision grip. Right? So it's quite a good base of support. So even if you can imagine they're not able to grip properly, just put their hands in, try to get them to bend before you continue. We have a bigger version as well for larger objects. So let's say when it comes to a bottle, yep. typically like the elderly, they have to use something like, you know, they have a sippy, sippy cup type of bottle. Right? Yes. So this one, this one actually goes around the bottle itself. And yep. again, it helps to solve the precision grip. And for you as a physiotherapist, would this probably complement um, what, what you do for the patients? Again, goes back to how much movement they're able to do before you hand them right. over to them. So if they're able to again do, then you can start retraining again, not with something so big. I usually start with a plastic cup, a very light plastic cup. Now, bear in mind, I'm sure everybody tuning in can agree. Oh, this we, one is plastic. We never give them anything that's heavy, <laughs> ceramic anything that's glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we start off with something extremely light. Right. We connect this to them. And then after that, again, if the tremors are under control, if they're able to understand basic instruction, then we train back again. So fingers in, try your best to grip. So it's not so much a precision grip for this. It's more a palm one, mm -hmm. because you use a bigger surface of your palm to hold a glass, right? Not just the final one like holding a pencil. Mm -hmm. So based on that, we try our best to have them hold, lift, with an empty cup first, not with a cup filled with water. Mm -hmm. See if they can perform first. If they can, then by making it a little harder, what we do to make it harder, we add a little bit of water, just plain water. Anyone then, not even half a cup, I would say maybe a quarter cup. See if that patient, sick patient, can effectively control the tremors long enough to bring the cup to the mouth right. to sit. Because sometimes what we might see is patient might have very minimal tremors initially, but as they try their best to lift, the closer it gets to the mouth, the more it starts to shake. Because you need to practice more control. The patient requires more control of muscles to hold the cup in place and then to rotate a little bit more to bring the water in, right? So these are things that we have to assess first, train, retrain, and then only we make it harder by adding water. Water is good, then milk, and then so So it's like a so slow far. development process. Yeah, it's always a step-by-step -step process. And that's why I said we have to assess each patient individually. And based off the assessment, we try our best to come up with realistic goals for said patients to achieve. So what if, what if it's more like, because a lot of our audiences here, yeah. our audience that's here today, they already are living with someone who has nothing sense, Yeah. right? And depending on the severity of that said case, um, would this be able to help them or not? Like, if let's say they are already experiencing tremors, right? Would you say that this one, yeah, sure, if you have a tremors in your hand, you can go ahead and try it. Or would you recommend more towards like, you know, really just go and do the proper assessment first before you get to it? Um, I would never say don't try it all. Oh. Regardless of whether it is an early onset of uh, Parkinson's disease or a more later severe onset of it, I would say as long as the patient is able to perform some amount of movement, whether assisted or unassisted, no harm in trying. But again, if those tuning in are not too sure about what it is they need to do, even though we have spoken quite a bit, then always no harm in giving us a call sure. and on anyone that you know of for that matter to perform an assessment. Sure. We'll, we'll have a short Q&A session near the end of the webinar. So uh, if the audience actually has any questions in mind, you can already start by posting your questions and we'll address them by the end of the webinar. Okay, while we're in the realm of food and drink for Parkinson's patients, I have here a few other utensils as well from uh, this company called ETEC. And ETEC is one of the many brands in the country and I uh, the mostly bathroom experts. But here we have uh, utensils. We have here this deep dish uh, utensil with a curved uh, inclined plate. You can see that it's a 
tilted one way. And there's also this angled spoon, one for right-handed and one for left-handed. I'm going to pass these to you because um, I'm not too familiar with these, but in your experience, would this be able to help Parkinson's like that, those with, with tremors? So again, we go back to what I said earlier <laughs> about the different types of grip and how much they're able to open or close the right, right. So always something with a bigger grip here helps in helping patients hold things a little better, can definitely be used. Now, it doesn't have to be this particular brand. It can be any other brand, regardless mm -hmm. of the size. Right. But always, the bigger the grip hold, the holding area, the better it is for the patient. Does it use less strength to grip something that's not? Um, not so much, so much strength. You need strength nonetheless. Because again, okay. you have to understand that when it comes to feeding yourself, right? right. Whatever it is you're holding, whether a fork or spoon or a spoon filled with food, or soup or whatever, it's not too heavy. What we want is to make sure the patient is first and foremost again, able right. to perform the movement. And if they can help, it helps using something bigger than this or as big as this, then definitely go for right. it. Right. But you can see this spoon here, right? It's more like angled, yep. it's angled here. So is there a difference in movement when it comes to, like if I were to use a spoon, like let's say I'm gonna pick this up here. This is like a basic normal spoon. If I eat, I tilt the spoon inwards and I feed it myself. I feed myself like this. Yeah. Whereas this spoon is already tilted inward. So the movement less that I effort. Do, the less patient, effort. The patient requires less effort. So if you use that spoon, like what you right. said, once you tilt, you have to lift some more. Uh -huh. And if a patient is having difficulty controlling, often than not, you notice a spillage. Oh. Right? Whereas if you can at least train the person using something like this with a curved edge to bring it closer, all they have to do is instead of tilting, bring the mouth closer, not too far close enough for them to bring the spoon to the mouth and then they suck it in very slowly, very gently. Now again, however, I want to stress if a patient um, has difficulty swallowing, then again, maybe this is not too recommended. But if you are with a patient, working with a patient, uh, if you are a caregiver and you know your patient is still able to chew to a certain degree, is able to swallow efficiently, in those instances, this spoon definitely recommended, no issue whatsoever. Okay. Thanks very much for input. Um, okay, very quickly, just one other thing that I have here. You mentioned uh, earlier that a bigger grip and a better grip would be able to help the patient's patients, right? So here I have another product from eTech. This one is uh, the three in one grip or two in one grip. Yeah. It just looks like this. And it's made out of some uh, rubber type material. It's also very, very easy to grip. Now it has two holes, one at the front, which is a uh, small, and another one at the back, which has this bigger one. And how this is supposed to be used is that you can insert anything like, say, a toothbrush over in the back. Just insert it like this. Yeah, so this one actually has a flat, flat edge. If you have a rounded toothbrush, you can insert it on the other end. And this sort of like enlarges the grip of yes. the patient. Um, if I were to use, like, let's say a razor, even though I, I don't know if Parkinson's patients should be using razors. No. <laughs> Often they're not, we don't recommend. Right, right. But uh, you can see that it fits here just fine as well. Maybe, maybe the round and toothbrush rather than a razor. Yeah. yeah. So if, if you have a Parkinson's patient at home, please stay away from the razors. Do, do, do. Anything sharp for that matter. Though. Anything sharp, yeah. No yeah. scissors, knives. Yeah. yeah no, no. No. Keep your keep your loved ones safe. safe. So I'm going to hand this to you and uh, do tell me if it might be able to help like this grip. So again, if they can grip and if they can bend, mm -hmm. definitely. So if you can imagine brushing your feet, it's a lot of effort. So if I were to take this, let's say out, mm -hmm. the distance in which my hand needs to travel into my mouth and then subsequently be able to move up and down and rotate yeah. and all that, it's a lot of effort. Okay. Now that's for someone like you and I. Now, for a patient with Parkinson's where they easily get fatigued, especially as they progress, you want to limit as much exertion as you can possible. So with the help of a caregiver, if you have this, just put it in. And again, if they are able to at least initiate the movement at least half of the way, half of the way, meaning at least from about here, once you put the toothpaste on and all that, assuming there's a little bit of help, right. you can at least try to get the patient to bring it to the mouth mm -hmm. and then try 
with tremors and all that, even with the tremor, you'll notice them still trying to do very slowly. It is something that is done extremely, extremely slow, but the only problem they will have is when they are trying to get it from one direction, example, if they're rushing downwards first, right, right. to rotate and do the up one. So that one usually they require assistance. It's not something they can do very easily, but in one direction, whether up or down, always can be done. Okay. So I'm just trying to understand a little more about how to improve the quality of life for Parkinson's patients in the bathroom, right? So let's say we're talking about brushing teeth. I would assume that using a grip would definitely be safer as compared to something like an electric toothbrush. Um, it depends. It depends. So we, is it safe for Parkinson's patient to be handling a, you know, the, they already have tremors. The electric toothbrush itself will you be... You can use the electric toothbrush or even an electric razor in the initial stages again. If the, the tremors, stages. if the tremors, if the weakness that you see, if the rigidity is under control, mm -hmm. if it's not too apparent and they're still able to perform basic activities safely, then sure, no problem. But mm -hmm. as they progress in stages, um, again, as I said, gradually, you want to shift from anything that's electronic, anything that's way too sharp, to something that's a little bit more like this, a little bit more manual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to jump into a quick break here at this point, uh, one or two minutes. And then uh, when we are back, we're going to showcase a few more gadgets that will be able to help our patients, patients out. Uh, thank you much so much, Benjamin, so far for your thank insight you and your input. Uh, when we're back, we're going to be talking about uh, safety in the bathroom and also a little bit about safety and living aids that will be possible for patients, patients in the bedroom. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Excuse me, Eugene, we couldn't hear you. We have the homo chair with wheels. We also have a shower chair. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So we also have a shower chair over here. And what we have here is a freestanding toilet razor. Now, I'll be going through these things one at a time. First of all, uh, to sort of briefly describe the challenges that Parkinson's patients may have when going to the bathroom. Um, when you are having a tremors, so to speak, or having difficulty walking on your own, uh, when it comes to standing up, sitting down, it might already pose a very, very big risk. So when you have a shower chair here, not just for the patient, but for the caretaker as, caretaker as well, you have a nice, safe, secure uh, seat to put your patient down on. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what makes the E-Tech a little different from um, the other shower chairs and the shower commodes that um, you might have or you might consider, right? So the E-Tech itself, you have this um, small little patterns that are on the chair. So I'm going to bring this closer to the camera so you guys can see. Over here on the armrest, you have these small little grooves. And these grooves are present in the seat and on the backrest itself. So even if the patient is undergoing some tremors, you can know that whenever they sit down, they are safe and secure. There's enough friction to make sure that they are uh, sitting firmly. Sit. Instead of you know, some people when they sit, because of their back posture, because of their lack of strength in the lower body, they tend to slip and they tend to slide, right? I'm forcing myself to do this now. With the E-Tech, this grip helps prevent that and they can have a better, better uh, sit seating posture. This is pre uh, prevalent. This is available in all of their products. Number two, because 
um, different patients might uh, have might, might have different heights, right? The seating uh, is very important for us to have height adjustability. So down here we do have the height adjustable legs. I'm going to take out one piece from the seat. And this will ensure that you can adjust the seat according to your loved one or your patients in the higher height. Okay. Is there any difference uh, when it comes to Parkinson's patients? You mentioned before that the height adjustment for the cane, yeah. uh, we need to follow the crease. What about seating? You want to make sure when they sit down, they are at a proper height when both the knees are more or less closer to 90 degrees. Oh, would you like to come and show, show us, sort of like give a small demonstration by at 90 degrees? Let's see this one for me. If I sit down here, is this sort of like 90 degrees or no? Yes. Oh, so my height would probably be the lowest height on the yep. other type. Yep. <laughs> also, when considering the height, whether it's a commode or any other sort of chair, you want to make sure the height is as close to 90 degrees or slightly more so that when it's time to transfer, for example, to stand, to go from, example, the commode to the wheelchair, for example, the patient is able to put a certain amount of effort. If too low, Patient has to put in too much effort. Now, bear in mind, Parkinson's diagnosed patients, they tend to fatigue easily. Mm -hmm. You don't want to exert too much of stress on them too soon. What about patients with Parkinson's plus? Because that's when everything is out of the window, right? That is 100% dependent already. Yes. So I would assume that things like this would probably help the caretaker a lot. A lot better in the sense that you have the layers that are easily removed. So mm -hmm. if the patient, even with the right height, is unable to even stand up with assistance, then all you have to do is put the wheelchair next to it. Mm -hmm. And in one swift motion, just lift and pivot. And then after that, do the same thing with the legs as well. Mm -hmm. Even better if you have extra hands on board. But if you're really one person, not an issue at all. We have also the impact queen which I think eliminates the need to transfer from wheelchair to seat as well. Yes. Yeah. So for the audience that's watching, this is the one. Uh, talking about assistive gadgets, this is definitely something that you could use. Uh, bed pan is optional, but if you would like to have a bed pan with you, it's also available. What I really want to show you guys is this chair right here. If you're looking for safety in the bathroom and uh, solutions when it comes to transporting your loved ones, this is the one you want to go for. We talked about earlier about how this armrest is very crucial for there to be an open space, right? So this one, at the back, there is a small button here. And then you can sort of like click this and hold it up just like that. Okay. So very, very nice, very, very handy. And you can just do a transfer. There's also a foot brake down here at the custom wheels. One, that's two. So once you have the brakes in place, it's non movable. And this one you can really, really uh, use for your Parkinson's patients. The seat itself is ergonomically shaped as well. So if you're looking for a gadget to make life easier for both yourself and the patient, uh, this is one that I can recommend. Would you recommend this as well, Benjamin? No, oh, definitely. Okay. Uh, just to share a little bit more about the product with you guys. This entire piece is also corrosion resistant. The frame itself comes in one entire piece, so water doesn't go inside and damage it. The only reason why it might get damaged is it uh, blunt force sort of takes away the paint from the frame. This white color frame here, if it takes off the paint, then it might get cor uh, corroded or rusty. Otherwise, this one is fantastic. However, uh, like uh, Benjamin mentioned before, in the earlier stage of the webinar, uh, each patient is different, the needs will also be different. So if you're just looking for someone, uh, something to help you to get up easier, if you're still highly functioning, you can go to the bathroom by yourself, then this toilet seat razor um, adjusts the height so you can have your 90 degrees when you go to the washroom and also these armrests to help yourself get up.
You can check out the full list on our website. Um, plenty other products like these that are great. Just wanted to showcase this one for you guys so that um, you, know, you guys have a little bit more knowledge or insight when it comes to what to look for when you're looking for bathroom safety for your Parkinson's uh, uh, patients or ones who are suffering from Parkinson's. Okay, for the last bit, I want to talk about uh, bedroom safety. Now, if you go to, we're running out of time, so uh, we might just showcase this another day. But if you go to our website, www.iother.asia, you'll be able to see a lot of solutions, including our comfort wooden bed. Yeah. And uh, if you'd like to find out more about these things, you can always just give us a call. The, our number is listed in the website itself. Okay, so um, we're going to open up for a very, very quick Q&A with uh, Benjamin. And uh, so if you have any questions, you can type it out in the chat now. And uh, Kelvin, maybe you can assist us in asking your questions. Okay, welcome back and welcome back, my chairman. <laughs> Good Thank to you. be sitting down in the chair again. All right, we're going to go through the questions very, very quickly. Uh, we've accumulated a lot of questions early on during the webinar, during the presentation itself. So, uh, what are some of the questions that we have, uh, Calvin, if you don't mind? We, we, we just answer it from the top, make sure everyone's questions get answered. Well, one of the questions uh, is where can uh, the audience get the Yes. Where can you get the utensils? Well, iElder.Asia carries everything that we've showcased here so far. Uh, so if you'd like to make a purchase, you can contact us or just view our website at www.iElder.Asia. Mm, no problem. Uh, yep. Does that answer the question? Yeah. In the second question, is about this infection Okay. What about electric to brush? Oh yeah, so uh, for electric toothbrush, Benjamin explained before, uh, it really depends on the, the level of severity of the patient. So if you see like the patient, you know, still has the ability to grip, yeah. then yeah, by all means, you can use an electric toothbrush. Yeah. Yeah. No more. Okay, so that's the end of the questions that we have here today so far. Uh, was there one about step walker? Yes, there's one about uh, whether I ever has a step walker. Okay, so our entire catalog can be viewed on uh, our website. If you have any questions for a product that might not be there, do give us a call or drop us a WhatsApp on, uh, you can find the numbers on our contact us page. Yeah. So uh, I think time is a little tight. So thank you so much, Benjamin, for coming here today. Thank you very much. Uh, if uh, they want to contact you for any uh, visual or, or any assessment, how can they reach you? Well, we are on social media at Global Home Health. We are both on Facebook as well as Instagram. Um, other than that, you can also contact us at 03-6201-5151. Just give us a call. Let us know how you heard from us, what you require, and we can schedule an assessment for you as soon as possible. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. That's going to be it for our webinar for today. Uh, if you have any further questions or if you want to drop us feedback on our webinar, uh, you can do so. We'll be uploading the video up on our Facebook channel, uh, Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash iota.asia or just go to our contact us page, drop us a WhatsApp and we'll be more than happy to answer questions. Once again, thank you very much for the Malaysian Association of Parkinson's uh, Disease. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah, for making this uh, opportunity available for us. And we'll hope to see you in our next webinar happening sometime. Uh, next month or two months from now. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye.